Right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Charlie and I work at Cartosa as a senior geospatial technical person um, and I have created the Geodata Mart application and platform which can be used um, to retrieve um, geospatial data for a specific area of interest uh, very quickly and easily and gives a kind of e-commerce type user experience to retrieving um, geographic information, right? So I'm going to dive right in and just do a brief demo on how to use the application. Um, right, let me share my screen. Right, so um, if you have a look at the application itself, um, of course, it's just a standard interface. Um, the entire application is open source and available on GitHub. If you go to the about page, you'll find that there's a link to the source code, um, which you can view on GitHub. Um, under Cartosa Geodata Mart. Right. So um, anybody can run their own instance of the application. Um, the version that I'm demoing today is um, the instance that is running at data.cartosa.com. Um, and this was set up as a um, kind of uh, supporting utility for the geospatial data science um, certificate that is uh, the course is being offered um, as a collaboration between various agencies for South African schools uh, and, and school children around the country. Um, the public sign up uh, is available in the application, but we have disabled it on this instance. So in order to get your login credentials, they should be sent to you by your course coordinator. Um, if you have any challenges, you can reach out to us um, at info at Cartosa. Or if you have access to Moodle, you can chat to your coordinator through the Moodle platform. Um, you can see that basically it gives a kind of gallery view to all of the available items and projects. If you try to access any of these, of course, um, from this interface, it will ask you to sign in um, because it's kind of locked behind the auth wall. Uh, you can still search the platform publicly. So you know, if I look for projects that you know have the NGR, um, information in them, you know, they'll show up here. But again, if I want to access it, I will need to log in first, right? So you should have your credentials available. Once you sign in, you will gain access to the platform. And um, now you can kind of view the project details. Um, if you go back, if I go back here to the uh, homepage, you'll find that the, the top image is, is one big hyperlink, which takes you to the project details page. Um, and then if you go to the, the lower left, you'll see there's a small get data button, which will take you to the map view. So if you don't want to review the project details, you can just dive right in and uh, start retrieving data if that's what your goal is. Um, you'll notice that there are two different kind of types of um, projects available essentially on, on this platform. We have the well, projects themselves, which are kind of map projects with various layers and so on. And then there's actual data items. So for example, this nat natural earth item, as you can see in the center of the screen here, um, it's just a geo package with a QGIS project embedded within it. And it has some high level natural earth data that just is like a nice global base map. And there's two different themes for dark and light mode, etc. So it's a, a very basic um, item. And you can just click on the get item um, to download it directly, or if you click on the item, it'll bring up the details page, tell you more about it, show you a preview, and then if you click download, it'll just start downloading, right? So that's how the, the data downloads work for like generic items. You know, if you're a course coordinator, um, you can, for example, package a project with various layers and data, um, and put it in a zip file or a geo package or, or whatever you need, um, or just like basic data items if people need to download a large raster layer or something you can put it on the platform and people can um, retrieve it uh, it's also kind of designed for multiple data vendors so um, if you you can use it as a single instance can work collaboratively across different agencies right so you can have uh, different schools for example can actually have their own kind of portal for like allowing people to access um, items and so on that's that's kind of the idea and, and the structure behind it. Uh, if you want to just retrieve some data, you can select your project. Um, it'll take you to the details page um, for that particular item. It loads. Seem to be having a wobbly live demos. <laughs> right. 
Cool. So this is basically the project details, um, which will give you, if the coverage is configured, um, it will give you the, the actual coverage. Uh, I don't know which tab is open now. Um, apologies for the large preview image. You can see that I'm zoomed in to kind of allow better viewing on, on recording, um, but the, the actual size on the <laughs> browser is not so um, obscenely large. Um, but basically, if there's a project co coverage configured, it'll show you the coverage of the project, you know, where the data is available or not. It'll tell you um, about what layers are available, what base layers are included in the, in, in the map. Um, and then there's a view map button where you can go to retrieve the data. So you can just go through and see, is this the data that you're looking for or not? Um, these kind of gray patches at the moment are like, it's kind of alpha level functionality, but basically those will be uh, legends for, and, and like they'll bring up a, pre, a layer preview so that you can actually introspect each layer individually and like make sure that it is the data that you want before you go to the map view. Um, once we go to the map view, um, you should, see the um, right so the map is a basic kind of web map view um, which doesn't actually show the data itself so it's not like you can preview the the data by turning the layers on and off etc um, it's basically there for you to um, select which layers you would like to process, right? So the, the, the primary purpose of these maps is to clip and ship the data to you. So basically, uh, you can see I have no layers selected, so I cannot run any process. Um, even if I select some layers, you can see that this is still grayed out and I can't select it. And the reason for that is that I haven't defined my area of interest. So I would pick a particular area of interest, say Cape Town, for example. If I put a point down, it'll just you know buffer that point by like a kilometer or so and then generate an extent. If I add another point, so I can click on, on areas of interest and you know particular areas, it'll just expand to cover that entire zone as a single extent. Um, I can also draw various features, so you can just select uh, an area with a rectangle. You can draw lines as well, and it will include those in the extent, and you can actually just digitize around areas of interest with the polygon, and it will also include it as well, right? And then, um, if you you know need to edit this at all, you can actually uh, click on the item. It will bring up the little editing pop-up, and then you'll get this edit view where you can see these different nodes that you can drag around the map, and then extend the the um, area that's going to be clipped. Yeah, if you are in edit mode, you can actually drag this around. Um, you'll see that the extent area stays static, but the the actual geometry um, can be moved. Uh, and then you just click on the map, but outside of the area of that polygon, and then it will uh, redraw and, and put everything back in place. If you want to start over, you can just clear the clipping region with the delete button on the map. Um, you can also, if the, the project coverage is, is configured, you can add that. So you can see this green buffer around the border of South Africa. That kind of represents where data is available in this project. Um, if you draw your region of interest, um, and you would not like to actually see the the maximum extent. You're only interested in, in um, your region that you've digitized. You can actually toggle that off um, or on. Uh, and the same goes for the, the the limits. So basically, each project has its own uh, limits to how much data you can process at once. So. Um, uh, for instance, this project is kind of national level, it's high level data, like you've got uh, dams, uh, uh, rain collection areas and so on. So you can actually select quite a large area um, in, in order to process. Uh, whereas if you use the NGR project, you can see that the, the red zone is kind of the maximum area that you can um, process. Uh, and if we make this a bit smaller, You'll see that it becomes blue once we get into like the, the maximum area. I think in this instance, it's probably around, you can actually check uh, if you go to the settings tab and you go to the clipping buffer uh, info tab, it'll actually tell you, you can select any area for this project that's you know under 40,000 kilometers squared. Uh, for the uh, NGR data or the, topo, the topographic data for South Africa, that limit is much smaller because the data is much more dense. So the processing capacity and everything for that project um, is, is much higher 
and you kind of want to restrict users to like select a much smaller area uh, for each processing job that they, they would like to um, do. So uh, this project is 40,000 kilometers. Um, I think the NDR project is 400. Right? And then if it's too large, once it goes beyond that, you'll see that it, it turns into this orange um, to let you know that, you know, invalid extents have been selected. You will see that you aren't able to actually select the, the clip and chip button anymore. Um, and it draws this big red square, which kind of represents the maximum area of interest. Uh, of course, there's no way for the system to know, you know, what shape that you're looking for. So if it's, if it's something that's very long, um, <laughs> Uh, you know, and it, it gets beyond that, it, it will still just draw a red square. It's just to kind of visually guide you into, you know, what the appropriate area or zone is. Um, and then you can also turn it off from this little uh, layer selection widget, right? Uh, you can also to toggle the buffer zone. So um, if you draw an item here and Town, and I would like to buffer that region that I'm drawing uh, basically, this extends what the, the area you've drawn to be like, you, it, it goes beyond that extent. So basically, if I draw around or uh, put points around like my, my areas of interest that I'm really interested in looking in, um, I kind of want to go beyond those boundaries so that when I make a map, I don't like clip the map at like prematurely or anything like that. And so you can add buffers. This also makes a lot more sense. Um, we will be adding more mapping modes. So basically users will be up, able to upload. They're, they're um, not active at the moment. But users should be able to upload, say like your own street. Um, and then you can just uh, upload that as a line and then we can buffer it on the system to whatever, two, two, two kilometers and so on uh, from that street to create your area of interest and so on. Uh, so. Yeah, it's, it's not necessarily all that like useful when we're using this extent mode, uh, but it is kind of the, the default that we kind of expect to use. Um, and then, yeah, you can uh, grow or shrink the buffer with the slider function. You know, um, if your area of extent that you've defined is too large, you can also try and reduce the buffer so that it fits within that zone. So that big red block that I was showing earlier, um, that actually should include the buffer in its calculation, right? So if we show the max extent, um, let me just edit this, put it right on the borders of that. Right, so you can see the area is blue. If I make it too large, it will go beyond that border. You can see that the gray area is outside the extent and then I can shrink it back until it becomes a valid extent to clip to. Um, and then, yeah, uh, basically you, you go through the map, you um, select your layers that you would like to clip. In this instance, I'm just selecting cities and dams. Um, I can also go down the map and select something like rain stations and provincial data. Um, and then I can go into my project settings. And by default, um, for most of these projects, we're just setting uh, you know, the, the coordinate reference system uh, for the, the QGIS project that is exported. And then for each layer. So if the source layer is not in this particular projection, um, you know, it will actually be reprojected as it gets clipped. Uh, if you set this to none, it will actually come through without, it, it will be clipped, but it won't be reprojected. Right. So we typically want all of our output data and the project to all be like coincident and use the same projection um, for the map and all of the data. And we typically want that to be an actual like uh, map, Cartesian map projection, right? So uh, <laughs> something with with metric units, preferably in South Africa. Um, right, and then there's base layers that you can select. Uh, this varies from project to project as well, what's, what's included. These are typically things that come from web services. So for example, here, it will be the OpenStreetMap uh, XYZ tile layer. Um, you can select the Maps in global, global Terrain when it's available, but just a word of warning that uh, the long-term release version of QGIS, uh, this does not re render appropriately, right? So it's, it's bundled into QGIS 3.26, and it renders as a nice uh, digital elevation model of the world, but if you're using a, an older version of QGIS, this will not render correctly, right? So that's off by default. Um, if you are a project coordinate, co uh, sorry, coordinator, um, you can also like define for each project which layers are on or checked on by default, right? So you could say, for example, roads and towns are on by default for a particular project. 
Um, and then once we've selected our region of interest and we've selected our layers, we can just press clip and ship. And this will bring up the checkout window where we select, you know, we can review the um, task that's going to be processed. So um, if this was not the particular layers that you actually wanted and you didn't want to really process this, um, you would cancel it. Um, but in this instance, we really just want to go ahead and process it and produce an output. Um, th this is a major consideration for like when you introduce something like a credit based system where people can only download or or um, process a certain amount of data on the platform. Uh, for now, it's kind of unrestricted uh, and we're just relying on people <laughs> to um, behave themselves. We do have like in the back end, like logging and so on, so we can see if people are abusing the system. Um, but for the most part, we're just kind of like leaving it up to people to be responsible as much as possible. Um, and once you start, once the process starts running, you'll see that um, it takes some time to set up a, a processing job. Um, this actually on the back end will set up QGIS. It will load the, the source project, which is also a QGIS project. And it will uh, iterate through that project and find all of the matching layers from the selected map and it will actually run a clipping algorithm on them. Um, and then it should tell you like each time a particular layer is updated and so on, um, and you know, go through and, and give you some feedback on, on um, how the progress is, is getting on. And then once it's completed, you should be able to find this uh, download page, um, which when you click it, will just produce a zip file with your output available within it. Right. So, um, as an example, let me open this. This will bring up a zip file, which in this instance you need to, of course, um, an archive. The, the naming convention, this name is actually a reference to the task ID. So if you have issues, you know, you, you, for example, you, you try to process something and it didn't work, you can actually get feedback uh, from the team. You can contact us for support or something and, and give us this as a reference. And then we can look it up on the system and say, hey, this task did not work uh, as expected. You know, what went wrong or what what, what the issue could be. Um, and also to make sure that when you download your files, they've got unique names and so on. Uh, and then inside this zip package, you have a geo package file. So, um, you would also have any kind of sidecar files, like if you had aerial imagery that was also part of the project um, or, or some, sort of, some other sort of raster data that was kind of uh, adjacent to the geo package, that would be included in the zip as well. Uh, for now, we've just got a geo package which has a QGIS project inside it, right? So if we load up this geo package in QGIS, uh, just refresh that, you can see there's a geo package file and you can rename this to whatever you want. Um, and here's all our data, right? So the first two tables that you're gonna find in here most likely are probably not very interesting. This is just the area of interest that was clipped. So if I go down to my coordinates window here, I use the Easter egg for typing in world. I can bring up a world map and then you can see this is my area over Cape Town, right? So that's basically just the area of interest that was used or the, the bounds that were used to clip your data. Then we have the geodata mart table, which just gives you some reference information. So if you had to share this file with someone else, um, it's, it's a bit of metadata that you can use to reference it back to the platform. Um, you know, what user did it come from? What uh, what does the data vendor, you know, um, what data it was processed and so on. So like if the project on the platform changes and so on, you can actually like get that information uh, retroactively. Um, but those are not very interesting. Of course, that's not what you use the platform for. <laughs> you really want to use the layers you selected. So basically from that, um, that map project that you saw on the web interface, um, you can see that all the layers we selected have now been clipped to that area of interest and they've been loaded into the map. Um, th there's lots of tools that do this kind of clip and ship functionality, to be honest, it's not like <laughs> um, unprecedented. But one of the great things about this is uh, the fact that you can also uh, load the QGIS project directly. So we have a QGIS project here. You can see it's called Geodata. And if I bring that into QGIS, um, I discard the current project. 
we should see, you can see all of the layers are turned off at the moment. But if I say show all layers, um, turn off OpenStreetMap, you can see that I've got all my styling and information from the QGIS project itself included in here. So at this point in time, we don't necessarily have uh, more advanced information on this data set. For example, the metadata tag, if you go to layer properties in QGIS, it should include a whole bunch of metadata about the source of the information and uh, attribution and all that kind of information, which if you set it up in the source QGIS project, it will come through in the results. So every time someone downloads the project, all of that information will be retained. So that's the basics of it. Like you you download a, well, you, you go into the platform, you select which project you want to download data from, and then you uh, define your region of interest and then process it and load it up in QGIS. Uh, one of the other great things about QGIS is that you can actually now in newer versions, you can just select the geo package, drag it onto the QGIS interface, and then it will tell you what layers are available inside this project. But you can just select the project itself, and then it will load up automatically. Right. Um, just maybe a, a, another kind of note of interest for people unfamiliar with you know, projection systems and, and that are kind of new to GIS, you'll see that this uh, clipping square, when you defined it in the web interface, it was it, it, it was like a square area. So if I actually bring up the AOI, you'll see this is not really oriented orthogonally to the rest of the, the, the map frame. So in the web map, you'll notice that it's uh, represented in, in Web Mercator, which is a different coordinate reference system, um, which in which the, the, the um, area of interest looks like a, a rectangle um, in the the actual rectangle should be defined by geographic coordinates actually so it's actually more of this like elongated rectangle um, but then once you project it to your local coordinate reference system it actually gets kind of skewed a little bit um, which is an it, it, it's an expected behavior um, right the other thing to just pay attention to um, maybe not that important for the context of like the, the geodata science uh, certificate, um, but just in general when working with spatial data is that when you do some sort of transformation on the, or mutation to the geometry information, the attributes can also get skewed a little bit, right? So for example, um, if you look in a provinces uh, data set, you might find that when you open it, it has a population attribute to something um, like even here, we've got like shape length and shape area. These are probably now incorrect because the original source that had this information stored within it has now been transformed, right? So if you had, for example, like a population field, you've clipped the geometry. So the population within that region is now different. So those kind of like calculated statistics that are generated through spatial analysis um, are typically modified when you do something like a clip operation here. Um, there are ways around that you can use a, a select like you, you can extract intersecting features instead of clipping them um, which we intend on like incorporating later on but for now this just does a standard clip uh, clipping algorithm which may transform your data depending on the context that context that you're working in um, it is also supported for the these geo packages to be uh, used with ArcGIS depending on the version that you're using uh, if you're using ArcMap, my recommendation is that you don't. <laughs> um, ArcMap, the, the kind of legacy version um, of, of ArcGIS, uh, QGIS, in my opinion, is just a much better product unless you're using, like, you've got licenses for some legacy system, uh, you know, with advanced functionality like spatial analysis uh, toolbox or something. It, it doesn't really make sense. Um, for ArcGIS Pro, however, which is quite a nice tool for publishing if you have access to Esri systems, um, then you can also load up like the Geo package in the same way. Uh, in your project folder, you can just go add a folder connection. Uh, you can go to the download, well, I added my downloads folder. Um, and then you can see the Geo packages here. So if I create a new map, uh, it's ArcGIS, so you might have to wait a long time before it actually loads anything. Um, <laughs> and then all of my um, data files are available here as well. So if I load up my cities or I load up my dams, you'll see that they get represented in ArcGIS. Um, you don't have the same styling information. So of course we're using like a QGIS specific processing thing um, and that's unlikely to ever change. And I don't think they're gonna incorporate like QGIS styling into 
octas. So, um, but you can access the data readily. It was pretty much anything that supports Geo Package. Um, it's just nice that you can load up the project and get the styling and information, metadata, and everything else um, directly in QGIS. Right. So that's the the gist of the platform. Once you've done your processing and so on, you can actually go into your my data account. So this kind of dashboard is available from various places in the interface. Like as you sign in, it should it should show up here. Um, but if you go to the user settings in, in the top right corner there, you'll see there's like a little user avatar and you'll see there's a my data tab. If you just click on that, it'll bring up this from any, like at any time, wherever you are on the interface, you can just go to my data and then it will bring up these items. And from this dashboard, you can actually go in and review your data, download it again if you want, um, and so on. One of the issues is that, I mean, at this point, it's not really a monetized platform and we can't really afford to just have endless data available, but we also don't know what a reasonable like window for making downloads available for and so on is. So at this point in time, we're basically just saying, uh, you know, we'll delete data when the server gets full. <laughs> um, you, you will sp still be able to reference your projects and so on. Um, there's a bit of a bug where you can't download live data um, from, from this dashboard. Um, but you'll see when the data has been removed from the server, uh, it, your icon will go blue. So if I click on this job that I've run previously, but I've removed the data off of the server, you'll see that the download is no longer available. But I do know that this job was processed and I should have downloaded it somewhere in the past. And if I'm looking for that file or folder name or zip file, I can just search my file system for this um, kind of key that was generated by the system. Right, so that's basically the use of the platform. Um, if there are any questions or queries, um, I'm, I don't know if you, YouTube con <laughs> comments are active, but you can contact either info at Cartoza if you have any issues or um, get hold of your course co coordinator through the um, Moodle platform. Or if you have any issues with the platform itself, you can go to the contact page when you're signed in and you can make an inquiry. If you've got an error, you can just make an error report or whatever the case is, and you can just contact contact us there. All right, thanks very much, and uh, happy uh, GISing. <laughs>